Welcome to the Terminal Value Podcast. We have Rami Assad with us today, and we're going to be talking about disrupting disruption, or really about the taxonomy of entrepreneurship and how it creates value in the midst of chaos. But anyway, uh, Rami, you've actually been involved in quite a few businesses throughout your life. I'd love to hear some of your experiences, some of the things you've seen, and just how it is that you've really seen disruption create value. You know, I think entrepreneurship in general has it has been kind of time again, been out there to, to kind of chart a new path, right? Entrepreneurs uh-huh. are built a little bit differently to look at what's happening today and say, like, there's got to be a better way, right? Whether that's right. something with like an iPod or just, you know, in software, right? Like yeah. you see inefficiencies and you want to make the world a little bit better and you kind of want to chart mm-hmm. a new path. And that to me is what entrepreneurship is all about. It's finding problems that you want to solve and finding a better way to do it. Yeah. And I think that is one thing that I heard an entrepreneurship definition that I heard that I really liked was an entrepreneur is somebody who identifies a problem that's not their own and goes out and finds a way to solve it for the benefit of other people. It may be a little romantic, but still, I think it's a good way of looking at it. I mean, because of course, right, you know, everybody wants to try to be able to earn a living, but ultimately the way that you would theoretically go about doing that is by creating something that's valuable. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think it's really important that I'll nuance it to say, I think sometimes it's good to have to feel the pain yourself to understand the pain, but you don't want to be so self-centered to not think about the broad applicability, right? I think success, especially if you're, you know, going on entrepreneurship or running in a raise like venture capital, like I've done in in my businesses, Mm -hmm. you have to think more about broad market appeal and and how many people can this impact? Yeah. Well, venture capital is a wonderful tangent to go on. And what the heck, we'll go on a tangent for a couple minutes. Okay. So I'd love to hear just your feedback on kind of the VC experience and what your observations are, because at the time of this recording, the financial markets are in the midst of just a complete meltdown. I think the S&P 500 at right as of right now is around 20-ish percent off its peak. Looks like it's headed lower. Crypto prices have just plummeted. And so there are a lot of people sounding panic buttons right now. And of course, you have VC firms all over basically said no new deals. And I know that being VC backed is, I know there's a cachet to it, but from what I understand, the uh, VC funding has a lot of strings attached to it. You're aligned as long as you're both trying, understanding kind of the deal that you're making, right? And the deal that you're making is that you're going to build a high growth, large business, right? The Mm -hmm. way that deal economics work for venture capped businesses is that each deal that a a VC does has to be able to pay back the entire fund, right? Because they're taking high risk bets. These are almost like lottery tickets. And so you have to build a big business. If they're going to put a lottery ticket on a business that doesn't end up being big, then even when it hits, it doesn't hit enough to pay off all the ones that didn't hit, right? So, and that's what the VCs are looking for. Now, Along the way, you might find that you can't grow fast, right? Uh You might find that you're not tackling a big enough problem that there's going to be enough demand that you're going to be a a huge billion dollar outcome. You might find a lot of different reasons that that things don't work out to the original plan. And that's where the misalignments start happening. And that's where people start feeling like, hey, I took money with all these strings attached. The last Uh thing that I'll say is you also have to have an outcome. Right. Mm-hmm. If you want to build a lifestyle business, if you want to be in charge of your business for the rest of you know time, maybe venture capital isn't the best way to build it because yeah. in reality, VCs make a deal with their purse strings, right? They have sure. money bags, they're yeah. limited partners, LPs that they raise money from. And they those people expect their money back in a seven to 12 year um, time horizon. Right. And so they say, Hey, I'm going to go find the best deals to invest in. You give me your money. I'm going to give you money back in seven to 12 years. And so that's their expectation of me. Right. If I want to keep running my business, even if it's growing slowly or whatever, they're going to say, Hey, I like, I owe people money. Like, I need you to exit. So those things you just have to understand about the ecosystem. But what it lets you do is grow artificially fast. Right. Mm -hmm. Because you're not just naturally recycling profits and growing slow and steady. You're taking lump sums of money that came out of nowhere and throwing gas on the fire and just blasting off. And for some people, that's more exciting. For me, that's more exciting. I Uh like building big businesses because I get to impact more people. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, and I think that was one of the things we were talking about about a little bit in the pre-show is about the idea of being able to, to impact people and really focusing on helping people. I'd love to hear a little more kind of about how you think about that and how that works its way into the types of businesses you, that you operate. 
Yeah. So my historically, my background has been in infrastructure and security. And so the first couple of businesses that I built were really around that because that was my core expertise. I would, you know, I could, I knew the industry, I knew the problem sets that existed out there and I had a customer base to listen to. This latest company that I'm running now called Finmark that we started two years ago really came from my own experience of running businesses and not having a sense of the financials and not getting a good sense of where our numbers were. And I realized that like, spreadsheets are not a good way to you know to model your business to keep yeah. track of your finances that there's got to be a better way and i yeah. talked to other peers other company founders and i realized that this was a you know kind of a a pretty broad problem overall so i you know it doesn't have to be something that you have a deep subject matter expertise in right so i don't have a lot of background in finance but i could bring financial experts onto the team to help me build it yeah. out you just have to have the, the natural curiosity to say what is this problem how does this problem work? How many people does it impact? And then what would be a better way to maybe solve this? You can ideate at a very high level and then bring in experts to build it out. You know, Steve Jobs, you know, isn't a hardware designer, but he right. had the vision to say, hey, I'm going to, you know, this is what I want. This is the vision of what I'm hoping to get. And let me bring some people that can execute on that. That's excellent. Well, and I think one of the things that really resonated to me with what you were saying is that, you know, especially as you're going into a business is if you're going to go down the route of seeking funding to really understand what that means. And, you know, as you said, your VCs, they have stakeholders. Those stakeholders expect a payback with a very considerable rate of return because they're taking so much risk. You go, okay. Well, so what that, I think what that also means is that, you know, if you're looking to create a lifestyle business, that going out and getting funding might not be the best model for it. That's probably a much better fit for a bootstrap self-finance type of situation. Yeah, I completely agree. And there's lots of great ways to build companies, right? You can get grants, yeah. you can get loans, you can, you know, self-finance it. You yeah. can start, you know, one of the best ways is start with a services business and fund yeah. product development with services revenue, right? Uh-huh. If you can't afford, if you can't get capital to build a product or you know build something, then what you have is your own time, right? You can yeah. sell your own time to generate money to then you know hire other people and sell their time, and then that eventually compounds to enough cash flow that then you can build product, right? So there's a lot of different ways of building yeah. businesses. Venture capital is a shortcut to jump starting building product. It can either really pay off big, but also on the downside, if you don't reach terminal velocity, you crash yeah. and burn, right? And so the outcomes are almost more binary than if you build a business a little bit slower from scratch, slow and steady, you know, then you have value that you're compounding over time and you don't have to worry about going to zero. Well, and yeah, I think the, you know, if you're going the VC path, it, it really is kind of a make it or break it model because as you said, you know, you have that seven to 12 year window and you're expected to hit your multiples within then or to know that it's not going to work, right. which usually involves crashing. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, so I think, you know, we, we've covered a couple of different avenues here. So let's say that we have somebody who's listening, who's really interested in kind of going down this route. They have this idea, they want to take it to market. What do you think is the right first thing for them to do? Well, so the first thing that I would do is really validate my idea, right? You don't have to build it to make sure that this is going to play out the way you think it is, right? So that means doing market research. That means talking to users who you think have this problem. Right. So you yeah. go out and you find a, a set of people that say, Hey, do you have this problem? You know, validate that this problem yeah. really does exist, get a better understanding of the pain point, the deeper pain points of the problem. And then start ideating on how you would go about solving it, right? Whether it's yeah. software or something else, whatever it is, right? Ideate on how you would solve this problem. It could be a hardware device, it could be whatever, right? And then go back to the people that you interviewed the first time that had this problem and say, would the solution? I'm thinking about building this. Would the solution solve your pain point? Get some feedback from them on that. But the most important part of that whole step is asking, is this problem worth paying for? Is this problem something that you would pay me for? And how much would you pay me? Right, Because that has a huge impact on whether or not you build the problem. A lot of people build the solution, right? A lot of people, you know, think, see a problem and maybe it's an okay problem. It's a, you know, it's a headache. We're coming in with you know a painkiller, but a painkiller might be too expensive, right? And so if I had to pay a hundred dollars for every pill of Advil, I probably would actually ever you know I'd suffer through the headache, right? But if you know if I had cancer and you told me, hey, I needed to pay ten thousand dollars, twenty five thousand, a hundred thousand dollars for this pill, 
you know, I'd try my damnedest to, to pay that, right? Yeah, and so right. you want to understand how crucial is that paying? Then now you have all the foundations of it. Then you can figure out, okay, now how do I go about building this product? Gotcha. One of the things that I think that you touched on that's important to think about also, you know, as you're looking at trying, you know, what kind of business you want to get off the ground is that product and service businesses are valued very, very differently, uh, which is, you know, because service businesses tend to be valued at single digit multiple, you know, say, I think around five times, I'll just use EBIT, but essentially your net cash flows. I would say probably somewhere between like, say, three and 10 times net cash flows. Whereas your product businesses, depending on the type of product, because, you know, if it's a physical product business, you're multiple will be a little higher. If it's a SaaS business, you know, software as a service, the multiples can be extremely large, particularly if you, I mean, the big thing now is recurring revenue SaaS businesses. Recurring revenue software businesses are valued at extremely high multiples. But of course, the flip side of that is, okay, you know, high valuation is great, but that carries with it an expectation to perform. Otherwise that valuation will not continue. And so what are some of the things that, you know, some of the experiences you've had in, in terms of navigating those dynamics? Because, you know, since you've been on a, a number of different steps on this path. For most of my businesses, they're software businesses. So I live in the software as a service um, realm. But my last company, Distill Networks, which we sold for nine figures, we had a services component. You know, I found that incredibly painful, right? Scaling up services, one brought lower valuation multiples to, you know, that revenue stream, but also it's really hard scaling people, yes. right? The reason that services has a lower multiple is one, you have to keep selling those services, right? And yes. so it's not just naturally propelling forward, not naturally recurring versus software, especially software as a service that's, you know, recurring revenue. People are just signed up, right? It's like your Netflix service, right? Like yeah. it's on autopilot until you know you sign up. Whereas a se- services, you have to keep selling it. You have to keep selling it, and the cost there's a cost to keep selling it, right? You have to pay yeah. somebody to keep selling it versus it being on autopilot. But two, software has higher margins, which means more free cash right. flow, which means that you can reinvest more into growth. So I get why there's the differences in multiples. And my experience was I had a really hard time scaling services. You know, in this one, we had an option of including a services component and I avoided it like the plague. I Mm -hmm. want to just build software from now on, but that's my personal preference. I like software. It's cleaner. It makes more sense in my head. Gotcha. Well, yeah. Well, I mean, and because at least in my experience, I think the tricky part with services, of course, is that services almost always involve people, which are hiring, developing and then retaining people is actually kind of tricky. As I'm fond of saying, particularly because, you know, in the event that you do get a genuine A player, you really have to understand that they're only going to be with you for a certain amount of time because true A players are going to leave and go do their own thing at some point. And so that's one of the things, at least in my view or my experience, that makes services really, really hard is because maintaining just top-notch and A-level team is very hard to do. Yeah. No, that's very true. I guess I never thought about it in the terms of the caliber of people. I actually always think about every employee because I guess I strive to always hire A players. I always think about every employee to say, I want you to give me a tour of duty. I want you to give me two to five years, two to four years of service. And then I want to level you up. That doesn't necessarily mean you have to go into management or you have to, but you need to constantly be learning. I don't want people that are stagnant. But the problem is, unless you're growing incredibly quickly, right? Yeah. You may not be able to give the person that next position that level up, right? If you're leveling up as a company, then yes, you can carry everybody up with you. But at some point, you're going to have too many people that want to level up that you can't give that next level to. And you have to just assume that there's going to be attrition. And I'm okay with yeah. it. I try to help my employees find new roles. As long as it's a step up for them, it makes me happy. That's great. That's awesome to hear. Well, let's see. So we've talked about navigating disruption and the VCs and going through that process of uh, kind of the multi-entrepreneurial life that you've been living. Give us just a last few last uh, thoughts or insights or pieces of advice for people who are looking to move into this domain themselves. I'd say first, I'll admit that it's primarily a young man's game or young woman's game. You know, without having done this before in my 20s, I would have had such a harder time the first time around. You know, a lot of people glamorize entrepreneurship. They look at it, it's glamorized on TV. There's a lot of shows, there's a lot of things. On a risk-adjusted basis, it's actually not a good endeavor, right? I'll, I'll be honest. You know, you are better off going to work for Google, you know, Facebook or or any other company that are paying a lot of high paying jobs. Now, if you don't have that opportunity, you didn't come out of Stanford or whatever, then maybe that is, then it becomes lower risk for you to do this, but it's hard work. It takes a lot of grit because you're going to make a lot of mistakes. I joke, I plowed the road with my face 
the first time around doing it. And with a family in your older age, it's just harder to maintain that. So if you want to do this, if you have the ambition to do this, do it when you're younger, when there's less risk for you, you don't have people that depend on you, just get out there and do it younger. Over time, you're going to have more baggage that's going to make this harder. And so that's, you know, the best thing that I would say for people that are looking to do this, Mm -hmm. go and learn, take that risk early, then you can always kind of default back to building a career or building kind of a slow and steady job if it doesn't work out. Got it. Well, hey, I really appreciate it. And uh, let's see. So want to make sure that everybody has your website. So I know your current website is finmark.com, F-I-N-M-I-R-K.com. We'll put that in the show notes also. But are there any other, which socials are you most, most active on? And are there any, any other places people can find you? Best place to find me is uh, at Rami Assad, R-A-M-I-E-S-S-A-I-D on Twitter. Okay, excellent. Well, hey, Rami, really appreciate your time today. Hey, my pleasure. So good to talk to you, Doug. Uh, likewise.